Welcome back to The Hustle Podcast. Today, I'm here with Theo Strauss, an 18-year-old designer currently in high school who will be working at Apple this summer. How's it going, man? It's going pretty well. It's going pretty well. It's taken us a, it's taken us a while to get this recorded. Um, I think it's like a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. I mean, I've had a, you know, I, <laughs> no I had a baby in, the, in that time frame. And Congrats. It, it, the whole world got turned upside down. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, uh, Theo's got to be by far the youngest person that we've had uh, on on this show, but super talented. So I've got, we got so many exciting things to to talk about. Uh, before we get into that, Theo, why don't you take a moment to uh, let our listeners know uh, who you are and what you're up to? Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm 18. I'm a I'm a senior in high school, and I was really lucky to have found my passion for design early on. So for the past five years, I've really been designing around future technologies. So whether that's been self-driving cars, electric mobility, uh, tablet interfaces, or most recently this question of how can we create apps without code? So I've been helping a bunch of companies um, with these challenges like Postmates X and uh, this summer Apple, and been working on these projects by myself, and I've been talking about them on Twitter. That's awesome. Um, so you're you're the guy correct me if i'm wrong but you're the guy that built his portfolio with figma correct i i did i'm pretty sure i was like the first <laughs> website i mean it's desktop tablet and mobile and i actually redirect you to the right figma prototype depending on your screen size yeah that was pretty cool it's like why would i need why would i want to code something if i don't have to uh it's pr it's pretty clear what you're passionate about huh <laughs> yeah i um, kind of put everything up front yeah. So uh, before we get into some of the, the work related stuff, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's like growing up in a in a city like New York City? It's pretty amazing. I mean, you have access to everything um, whenever you want it. And the energy is always super high. So everything you really do, like I walk faster than everyone. I remember when I was in California, like no one would cross a street when it was a red light. That was crazy. Yeah. Um, but you also have access to just immense diversity. So people from all walks of life. I mean, I get in a subway car and you meet, it's every color of the rainbow mm -hmm. and um, every flavor of personality. It will be 6 a.m. and there will be a mariachi band playing. So it's been pretty great. I think that's led to a lot of, of who I am as a person. Super high energy. I love talking with people. I think there's a huge entrepreneurial spirit in the city and it's really don't stop going and don't stop going until you're at a thousand miles per hour until you get something you want. Yeah, it's New York is a, is a great place. I mean, it's kind of hard to des describe the feeling of, of the city for people that haven't lived there. Um, I grew up in a really small town, but big cities always felt more natural to me. So when I moved to New York, I felt right at home. I actually felt more culture shock when I moved back, or I think maybe some people experience that the other direction. But do you do you think that you'll you know stay in a big city, or do you think that you know as you go on and do things in your life, you're going to want to ex experience different types of uh, of cities and experiences? I mean, last summer I was in San Francisco, and that's a city, but it almost felt suburban. I mean, I was living in this um, neighborhood and. I'd go outside at night and there would be no one on the street and it just didn't make any sense. Um, so I think there's something about this city where it's just so concentrated and you have that access to people. I can't give that up. So I'm in the tech world. <laughs> yeah. I'll be out in San Francisco for sure. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of like a pay my dues thing. So I'm going to pay my dues in Silicon Valley and kind of get back here as soon as I can. Yeah, I, c I can relate to that. Like, if you've lived in New York City, like every other city really isn't a city. If you're going to live in totally. a city, it's New York City totally. by far. I'm really excited to get out um, more into, like, Southeast Asia because I really want to explore the super cities out there. Mm -hmm. I've heard Tokyo stacks up pretty well against New York and Singapore. Yeah, I've never uh, I've been never been to Asia, actually. Yeah, last year was my first time I was in Hong Kong. And that was, that actually felt like New York in a lot of ways. Their subway, I'm not going to say it was better, but I'll <laughs> say it was cleaner. And I really liked how there was service in the tube. 
I'll take that in New York any day. All right. Favorite, favorite train line in New York City and least favorite train line. Okay. So my favorite train line, which I'm not on, is the one, two, and three. Um, they just come like once every other minute and you, the express line will get you anywhere in Manhattan really within like 15, 20 minutes. My least favorite train line is probably the G train. <laughs> it's very not known unless you unless you live in like Williamsburg yeah. or Greenpoint, but it only runs in Brooklyn. And God, it must come like once every 15 minutes. And they're, they have the oldest subway cars. And it just, it's just, it's not a great, it's not a fun time. <laughs> I will say that the train that I live on, the B train, if you don't get off at 59th Street, you will be going all the way up to 125th Street, and that will screw you over. So it's really important to get off the D or A train so you can make the local. That wow. has screwed me over a couple times. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for attending that. Let's get let's get back to uh, let's get back to business for a little bit. Sure. So, sure. Um, what was it that you wanted to be when you were uh, young and, gro- and growing up? That's funny. This is kind of coming full circle. I really wanted to be an anchorman. Um, I love talking with people, and you know, being an anchorman, you kind of can just talk with the entire country um, every morning or, or afternoon or night. So, I thought that would be great. Um, turns out it's really hard to become a successful anchorman. You really have to start off in a sm- small market like Burlington, Vermont, and maybe spend like three years there, get to like Tallahassee, maybe you get to like Raleigh, Durham, which is a sizable market, and then you, maybe you'll land like tw- 12 years later in New York and have the night shift. It could take you until you're like 42 to become a successful anchorman. And by then, I was told... No one's going to be watching TV anymore. <laughs> and I said, you know what? That's a pretty good argument. Yeah. Do, do you ever feel like there's moments when you're doing design stuff where you feel like you're an anchorman? Um, I'd say it's more the tech stuff that makes me feel like an anchorman. I love talking so much that it's really helped me meet people. And like when I'm at an event or I'm at a conference, having the courage to just go up to someone and say like, hey, who are you? Um, I'm Theo Strauss. That helps. So um, you said earlier when we first started that you know get it, design was felt natural for you to get into. Totally. How, how did that? How did you learn about design? Like how did how did that happen? Like it was really my iPod Touch that I got for my birthday when I was ten years old. It was the first one with the camera, and I got really into taking photos, and I just used that device so much that I saw that each app solved a different problem. And I said, well, I could make my own apps and I could solve my own problems. So I started designing the icons of those apps I wanted to design. And that got me down a long path into branding. And I circled back finally into, into UI design and, and said, well, I might as well build these apps. So I taught myself how to code. And that really cemented me in the tech world. Okay, so you, you consider yourself a designer and an engineer? Um. I'd say I'm a mediocre engineer. I think designing is the best way for me to solve problems and present my solutions as quickly as possible. If you said, why don't you build your, build your product in code? I'd say, give me a, a a few days and really good Wi-Fi so I could Google like 2000 times per minute. So this, this is just something that you discovered on your own. Like you did, there wasn't any outside influence, like suggesting Um, that you look into design. Yeah. I mean, my sister, who's four years older than me, uh, she got into computer science through school because she was in high school and there's a computer science curriculum. But I was in middle school and I didn't have access to that. So, I mean, it was really just Googling around and, and seeing what products I could use. My first design tool, I don't think many people have heard about it. It's Google Drawings. It's like there's Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, and you have to click a tiny little arrow and you see Google Drawings. And there are no shadows. There's no Bezier curve, pen tool. I mean, I opened up Sketch for the first time and I was like, okay, this is a Ferrari. And I've been driving a Volkswagen Beetle from 1960. So, I mean, what do you, <laughs> you know, I've been in the business for 20 years, so I've seen a whole lot of like shift and you know, the industry at large and tools and everything like, 
you know, how, how, what does it sound like to you when I, if I were to say that I spent most of my career designing software in Adobe Photoshop? Totally. I mean, I remember opening up Illustrator for the first time and freaking out. I mean, I pressed R and the rectangle tool didn't come up. Why does that make sense? I mean, it was so unintuitive. It felt like you needed to be a pro as an amateur. And I've been super lucky. I mean, my first real design tool was Sketch. That's pretty, I mean, a lot of people listening to this podcast must be like, this guy sucks. Um, he got pretty lucky there. But I've been really excited to see this tool space develop at an insane rate. I mean, I was using Sketch for three years and then Figma came around. Yep. Um, and now I'm working in this no code, how can we create apps without code space? And there could be a tool that comes around that has more features than Figma in, in the, on the data end side of things. And that can totally change the game. And if you told me four years ago that people wouldn't be using Sketch and Envision anymore, I'd be like, you're crazy. So I'm very interested to see where this space goes going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be huge because things move so fast. I, re I remember um, maybe, maybe it was five or six years ago and um, one of our designers, we, he had just joined us from college. He was like, why are you guys using Photoshop? Like, shouldn't we be using Sketch? And, and I was like, well, yeah, probably. But like, you know, engineers are still looking for this. But as soon as right. an engineer said, can we please get such Sketch files? <laughs> like, it just changed, right? And then, and, and then it's also and so the crazy. plugins, the red line plugins. Yeah. Oh, retro. And then, you know, like, it's... And then all of a sudden, you know, like now out of nowhere, you know, you know, Figma has like significant part of the market share. I can only imagine like what it's going to be like in another, you know, even even five years. I mean, I I have a table um, in Notion with every design and development tool out there right now, um, and the list is around 40, 40 rows. So a lot of people are trying to do the same thing Figma did to Sketch right now, um, and it's good. I mean, that's competition. But going back to like the you you starting out in Photoshop, did you really start out in Photoshop or did you really start out with pen and pen and paper? I remember a lot of people saying, "Oh, I sketch out all of my ideas on paper." And I've always been a horrible drawer. I mean, I'm better at using the pen tool in Figma to draw out my ideas than a pencil. Yeah. There I mean, I don't know if I don't know if this might have been before your time, but like when they when the iPhone first came out, there was this uh, there was this period in the industry where sketching UI was like real was was in high demand. So like people people wanted to pay designers to see the beautiful sketches on a dot grid pad versus like a wireframe. Wow! E even at the expense of like redrawing, redrawing, redrawing. That's redrawing, crazy. Redrawing, redrawing over and over again. I mean, I couldn't draw a straight line for anything. You couldn't pay me ten thousand dollars to draw straight. Well, with the dot <laughs> grid paper, you could, you know, with the little dots. But yeah, it's it was so crazy to see people just like, you know, I don't know, like people that wanted that back then. Um, and, you know, it's like it, the things have changed so much. Like I, I, you know, it's hard for me. I haven't. The last time I personally designed anything was maybe three years ago. Wow. Um, you know, I look at the tools now, and I'm like lost. You know, completely lost. Totally. Um, so. Um, all right, one second. Um, so, first, I mean, you already have a job lined up at Apple, and you're not even out of high school. Yeah. Do you even care about high school? Right. Like, it's like, pretty surreal. Yeah, I do. I mean, my family definitely incentivizes education and values education, and I completely see the reason to. Um, I've been keeping track over the past four years, how many people have said, are you going to go to college? And I'm at like 64 right now. 64 people have asked me. And yeah, like it's a great way to m have a community. And something I've really struggled with is that I'm super in um, to this passion called design and I haven't had anyone my age to share it with or maybe one or two people. And I feel like college, this next step is going to be like, wow, now there are all these people my age that have also been doing this stuff for the past four years, and I can hang out with them. I, I'm sure that you've thought about this or you've had people, you know, or you've talked to people about this, but just my impression of you and what you've accomplished already 
is that you're likely going to have more in common with the older pe older people that you'll meet at work than you will with those young people in design school. You, sure. you're, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of like what I most mean, people accomplish. Even when I was in preschool, I would hang out with the older kids. I think that's just been something I've always done. And I don't know. I think it's going to be interesting when I'm 60 years old, will I be hanging out with the 80 year olds or will I be saying, Hey, hold on. I want to hang out with the 25 year olds because they, they know what's up right now. So yeah. maybe wonder what the peak is. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's like my wife, my wife was in a similar position. She was a really skilled designer and she had, uh, when, at the time that I moved to New York, she had like a crazy cool offer to go work at RGA and, Oh my God. And, and she was like, do I do this? Or like, do I stay in school? You know, she, uh, she chose to go in a different direction, but you know, just like, yeah, you build relationships are probably the most important thing to, in my totally. opinion, being in general, but it's also mo the most important thing to having a career in design because often the people that you want to go work with or hire or that will hire you will be people that you know. And, you know, so I think what, you know, whether it's, whether it's call, no matter how much of the combination of work and in school you do, you do those, those relationships are always going to be the things like later in a life that mean the most, like you'll forget about the tools and the design. It's really, relationships are really key. That, I think that's a really interesting point because a lot of people have asked me like, so do you want to become a designer? And I don't know. I mean, oh, so you don't know yet. I, I think design is really the best way for me to solve problems I have and visualize those problems as quickly as possible. Um, but if I can do that and I can start a company around those solutions I make, will I be a designer anymore if I hire people to do that? Right. And I think as a founder, I'll be still very much like design thinking oriented. That's how I go about solving the problems from day to day. But will I call myself a designer? I don't even know if I'd like to call myself a founder. Maybe that's a little pretentious. <laughs> I don't know yet. I think that's something I'm still figuring out. That's awesome. Like uh, Grand Poobah, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is also something that I've been thinking about a lot lately too, you know, because the design business is booming and like, you know, like you can al almost trick yourself into making certain things. Like I often think about like, am I a designer or am I, like you said, like a founder, right? Um, I tend to want to call myself a designer because to me that means it's the way that I look at problem solving. Exactly. Um, and then you look at like specific titles, like are we digital designers or product designers? Like That's the whole problem. I yeah. mean, when I tell people I'm a designer, they're like, oh, great. Can you make this beautiful painting for me? And I'm like, well, that's an artist. Yeah. Or like, what about a logo? And I'm like, well, that's a graphic designer. And I might be able to do that, but that's not really the design I'm super into. Yeah. Um, I think designer has that ambiguity that can either be great or can be frustrating. I hope that, um, you know, your generation can take our field to the next level. Like, I mean, I think one of the biggest issues that our, that the design has right now is that it's just not, a, it hasn't been around as long as things like architecture. And Banking. so there's, there's no like consistency <laughs> in titles and, and, and stuff like that. I hope that, I hope that, uh, that, I hope that that improves. So uh, we'll we'll keep in touch on that. Something I've been thinking a lot about is is will design become even more of a selective pool, or will it really be democratized? If we have this tool where anyone can create anything, I mean, even with Figma, we're seeing pro professional designers using it. We're also seeing kids in third grade. Um, their teachers are introducing it to them to draw on it. And we're also seeing researchers uh, in academia using it to, to chart out their graphs. And will we see a further democratization of design tools where really everyone's a designer? Like what will design be 20 years from now? Yeah, uh, that's that's interesting. I mean, there, I know there's lots of debates about this. I mean, like, when, you know, there's like always like a Twitter shitstorm of, you know, people debating like, is everyone a designer, you know, but Should like designers code. Yeah. It, you know, the way that I think about design and like based on its actual definition, which paraphrasing is the act of, of, of intentionally constructing something. Um, I, I, I do believe that lots of people 
participate in design decisions, you know, which is one of the reasons why I love Figma. Like, you, you know, you, you can have engineering and business and, you know, UI writers and designers all participating in that. Yes, I also think that there, there, there is always like usually like one person that's responsible for thinking about that 24 hours a day. But I, I do think that like it's kind of, a, in my opinion, a snobby thing to say like, oh, like only designers design. Right, completely. I think design thinking, you know, David Kelly and IDEO have been a huge inspiration of mine. Um, and that idea that anyone can have creative confidence and anyone can, can think like a designer, that is really the democratization of it. For me, I mean, if you get an anthropologist in the room with an architect, with a graphic designer and a UI designer, I think those could all be considered designers because they're all thinking in the same way. Um, it's just how they apply their thinking to the to the problems they're solving and the products they're building. Yeah. Um, so tell me, I want to I want to talk a little bit. There was something that you you wrote in the notes when we were planning the, this talk that I didn't really <laughs> expect. This this whole you seem to be an expert in like cold emailing. Or even, yes. or even like enjoy doing it, which is, it's a weird hobby to have. <laughs> that is a weird hobby because it's like for a lot of people, it's the hardest thing to do. Like we, we you know, like even, you know, it, it, it means something to me because we're trying to do that too. So tell me a little bit about like how, uh, you know, some of the things that you've done in the, in the cold in the, in the cold emailing space and how that's, uh, helped you get to where you are right now. Yeah, it's. It's really helped me immensely. I mean, I design products as seriously as I design my emails. I think email is an art form. Um, and it really started when I, when I was 15 and I said, or 14, I said, screw summer camp. I want to work at a startup. And my, the startup that was most influential to me was Squarespace, talking about podcasts. And I said, I'm going to get an internship at Squarespace. So I designed, I wrote this, e this cold email to the CEO, and it was like three bulk paragraphs, long email. I mean, I would not have enjoyed reading it. And I sent it, and I did not get a response. So I sent it again. I did not get a response. I designed a card, and I actually hosted the email on a Squarespace website. I hand-delivered it down to the office. And I finally got a response. Turned out... I was writing to the wrong email, um, and and it didn't work out. But that prompted me to email around sixty five other founders that spring, um, and I got around like forty five responses. I got like twenty meetings, and I got zero offers. But what it taught me is really what is a good email, and I iterated on this emailing template just like I iterated on the on the user interfaces I designed. Um, I'd say the biggest misconception uh, in emailing is no one likes reading long emails. I call total BS on that. Uh, you can write an email that is the size of an essay. And as long as you connect every line to something about your background and something about their background, they'll keep reading it. Because people really like when they have something in common with you. And how I've gotten every internship um, really up until this summer, has been through writing a cold email good enough to get someone's attention. Wow, that's that's awesome. Um, are there, like, I mean, if the answer is no, that's okay, but, like, you, you gave one example of, like, what makes a good email. Like, are there two or three other sort of totally. tips you have? Um, I actually designed a template on Sketch so I could see what a email looked like on my computer and what it would look like on a phone. And a big tip I give is your, your email should be broken up into two line blocks. It should never exceed two lines because it will look way too long on a phone. Um, and when people see long paragraphs, that's intimidating. So even if it's a long email, only, always two line blocks. Oh, yeah. If it's two line blocks, they'll keep reading forever because it's like bite-sized chunks. It's like when you go to the movie theater and they, you get the small candies, you keep on eating them. Those mini Kit Kats will destroy you. Um, another thing is research. I mean, you, I, I say you should have read five links about the person you're emailing before you write it because that way you can connect as much as possible 
about your background with their background. And you can interweave that into the email. Like I go so far into like reading personal blog posts they've written and seeing what words they've used in their blog posts. If there's a synonym to those words in my email, I'll, fl- I'll switch them. So subconsciously, they'll say, wow, this guy writes like I do. Hmm. It's just like, how can we improve the chance that they'll give a crap about this email and respond to me by like 1%? And if you do that enough, you'll get to 100. Wow, that's, that's really awesome. Yeah, that's, I, is it stalkerish? I think it's just like, I think it's just persistence. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's. I, I don't see that as stalkerish because if you if you really truly want to uh, connect with someone that at, at a level where you would go to that amount of research, then it's there's a probably a good reason why, right? Like totally. Um, you know, I mean, like, we do that with probably everyone, but like yeah, I've I mean, looked up to people and I've and I've sent them an email. And I've just waited. I'm like, wow, it's going to be really great when I start to get cold emailed because I just want to care so much about responding to that person. And I actually just got a cold email a few weeks ago for the, like the first time. And it was written in the style that I cold emailed because he had read my blog post. And I said, yep, that's worth, that's worth <laughs> replying to. That's awesome. Um, yeah, if you, if you, uh, if you Google how to find a CEO's email address, apparently an article that Theo wrote uh, comes up as a top result it, in that. So it, it does. Could, That's uh, embarrassing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote that on Medium. It's pretty good. You'll find their email address. I think, I think the first thing is to find their work email address. But it gets really fun when you start looking for their Gmail. Because if you slide into someone's Gmail or personal email, that they'll get a kick out of that. Awesome. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm curious, like when I, and I'll just be honest, like when I was your age, all I was thinking about was skateboarding, girls, getting drunk, um, and just like, I wish I was, I have a skateboard and I partially know what a skateboard, but I'm not cool enough to really rock the skater vibe. I I will admit. (laughs) And punk rock. But like, I mean, punk rock, the only thing, the only thing, like the, like the thing, the one thing that we have in common is that like at, when I was in junior in high school, I got accepted into the design school that I wanted to be in. So like I was, I knew what I wanted to do as kind of writing it out, but by n- no way was I as like mature and motivated and, you know, and professional and all that. Like, are you a standout or like, do you have like other friends your age that are, that are just as New York. motivated as you are? Um, motivated. Yes. Passionate. I don't know. I think it's, super lucky to find a passion early on and we have this idea in america that you know don't worry if you don't know what you want to do you can find that in college and if you don't want if you don't find what you want to do in college don't worry you can become a management consultant and if you don't know what you want to do when you become a management consultant don't worry you can go to grad school and i'm very curious how we can bring that like passion finding down to high school and help kids find their passion much earlier on um, than what we're doing now. I go to an extremely amazing school. It's Dalton. If you are in New York and you have kids, send them to Dalton. Um, And they really support kids in finding what they want to do, which is great. Uh, I mean, we have a test kitchen in our school. So if people are into cooking, they can cook. Baller. Um, So I'm a standout in the sense of the tech world. I don't think I'm a standout in terms of of liking something, but I think there's much more work we can do uh, in terms of getting the number of people in my grade really into something that they would want to pursue throughout their life. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's been you know I graduated high school in 1996, and so I know think a lot of things have changed. But you know, um, you graduated college before I was born. Oh man, <laughs> sorry to date you. <laughs> hey, it's not how old you are; it's how old you feel, right? <laughs> totally. Um, when I was in school, it was the the curriculums were really based on the traditional fields: be a doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Like so, they're like they were all the curriculum was designed for like being an engineer or being a doctor. And like, if you didn't kind of fit into those molds and different learning styles, you were kind of like out here. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. since then I've, you know, I've like, even my brother, like who 
is uh, still older than you, but younger than me. Like, you know, they were teaching, you know, more like computer sciences and, 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 and other, other fields. I think it's awesome to, yeah, I think, um, I don't know, like, I, I, I do agree that people should find their passions, but I also, uh, I also do think that um, this world we live in pressures us to make decisions about what we want to do often before we're ready. Agreed. But, yeah. I think two things to be said here. One, um, yeah, I think there is still that idea that there are these main tracks that you need to go on. Um, it's been really difficult for me finding finding a place I want to go for school that allows me to both do computer science and design. Actually, design is usually in the School of Architecture. That doesn't make sense. Um, the second thing to be said is there are ways to help kids find their passion without boxing them into one of these paths, just like you're saying. And I think that's really where the term interdisciplinary comes in because interdisciplinary classes, classes that bridge computer science and design, that bridge philosophy and biology, like bioethics, that gives kids exposure to a bunch of things in one class mm -hmm. so they can really choose their choose their own path, like make your own adventure. And I think that's what we need more of. So we're not forcing kids to decide what they want to do. We're just giving them as much exposure as possible and helping veer them into a path where they can really f zero in. And then for those that do find design as a career path, I think our industry needs to be a lot better at like really making sure that we're not turning great designers into like really terrible managers. Agreed. Totally agree. Um, it's actually surprising that you said you don't, um, you haven't designed for three years. I was blown away when I met the head of design at a company and he's like, yeah, I haven't designed in like five years. I said, what? That's crazy. How could you want to do that? Um, and I think there is, there are people that go into the managerial tract. There are those people that stay in the, in the IC track. Mm -hmm. And the people who do decide to go into the managerial track, well, you really need to know what you're doing in terms of, of managing people because some people just aren't good at it. Or some people that are good at talking with people, it doesn't come natural to them. So I think this community is still young, but we're already starting to see people really want to help others grow as quickly as possible. Yeah, um, like I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm a big advocate for, I mean, I think design school, serious design school should have design management part because, you know, like. Which design school did you go to? Well, I didn't, I didn't go to like a, like, like a, like a real design school. Like I went to the Art Institute. It, for oh. me, for me, when I was growing up, it's exactly where I wanted to go be, because what I wanted to do was like design like opening credits of movies, like, you know, the, like the <laughs> nice. movie Seven, like. Yeah. I was I was into typography and crazy motion graphics, James and Bond. and that's 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 exactly where I wanted to go. Like I I didn't really want to like be on a computer all day. Like that was a geeky thing to me. Like I didn't want to like make websites. It just happened to be where like the future went. You know, like where the where the <laughs> things went and my interests went. You know, um, intro screens to loading screens. Yeah. <laughs> But, but also, like, you know, back in my day, like, the web design, like, every single website was a piece of art. Like, uh, you know, usability was out the window. People were using Flash and Shockwave, and, like, every, everything was, like, a unique expression, like, prior to, like, the age of patternizing things, you know what I mean? Um, it just so happened that, like, I'm a kind of a systems guy anyway, so, like, you know, it, you know. You were it, able to draw the connection. It, yeah, and it felt kind of natural to me to go towards, like, you know? I'm very curious how you even got into design to start with. Like, how did you know, one, like, how did you, did you, were you just watching movies and you're like, yeah, I want to design these and yeah, art school is the best option for me? No. Um, you have to be serious to want to go to art school. I mean, that really boxes you in. My, my father was a graphic designer. Uh, a, oh, that a, helps. A self-employed graphic designer. I mean, he doesn't give himself enough credit. Like, he, he referred to himself as a commercial artist. The, the kinds of stuff that he did was like, um, it was all by hand, like logos by hand. You know, wow. he would he would do big walls, uh, you know, murals. It was all typography and 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 stuff like that. You know, like he basically stopped his career when, like, he bought he bought the first Apple and he brought it home thinking he might use it, but he never did. Um, 
but you know, I used to like he used to work from home, and so I spent a lot. Of, you know, he used to work from home, and then he had a studio. And when I wasn't in school, I would I would always spend time with him. So I, I used to watch him work, and and I so I've always you know like I was always like very inspired by what he did. He was also an artist, like a a painter and a sculptor, and he had he had gone to architecture school and he had dropped out of architecture school. Um, but you know, like I always kind of knew that. I wanted to do something in the creative space and like the, you know, punk rock culture and skateboarding culture, like highly got me into design. Like, you know, punk rock culture was all about Xeroxing right. photographs and manipulating images and, you know, skateboarding graphics and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, so I always kind of knew I wanted to do that. Plus like we were talking about earlier, like I could barely pass any of their classes. Like I didn't do good in math. <laughs> I didn't do good doing science sciences and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, so I'd already kind of, you know, I'd made a decision very early on that I wanted to do something creative. It was, it wasn't till like someone that I knew, like connected the dots and said like, I don't know if you knew this or not, but like, there's like emerging field right now where you can, you take your artistic ability and like get that involved in like game design and like most, you know, like movie titles. And so like, then I was like, huh, like then it like. Then I was like, oh, there's a connection between like business and art. But I didn't really right. know what design was, you know. Anyway, enough about I mean, me. Enough about me, dude. I was I was surprised I got into design too. I, I've been one to know what I want to do early on. Wanting to be an anchor man. I mean, I wanted to be an anchor man from when I was seven to thirteen. It, it when I and then at thirteen, I was like, Cool, I'm on the tech train. Um, but I've always been jealous of people who've had um influences from their parents that are like great i can just inherit what you've been doing my dad is a banker and my parents wanted me to get into banking oh so i was long. just gonna ask you what your um, parents want you to do and you just answered oh yeah it on your own. my sister <laughs> and me have have gotten in fits with our parents about not wanting to go into banking um and i've talked with a bunch of people in the tech world whose whose parents were like execs at yahoo or execs at ibm and I said, wow, like, oh, the connections must have been so easy. I had, I had to cold email on my own. Speaking of connections, I mean, I had to go out of town on this kind of really depressing trip. My, my grandmother was dying, and so I went oh home God. to go Sorry. visit her. And I ended up with, at dinner with my uncle and my parents. And over this dinner, my, my uncle went on to explain this dinner that he was at when my uncle was retiring. My, my uncle used to be an executive at Exxon, like really, really high up. Like, wow. He used to like oversee all, all of Exxon operations in Egypt. Oh my God. Anyway, my uncle was telling me that he was sitting across the dinner table at my uncle's retirement dinner from Jeff Bezos's parents. And so at the end of that, I was like, hmm, I guess I'm going to have to do some networking because apparently my <laughs> uncle knows Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I, I was listening to um, another podcast, How I Built This, uh, with Howard Schultz, the, the CEO of Starbucks, and or I guess not the CEO anymore. Um, but he said when he went to raise his first round of capital for Starbucks in Seattle, he walked into Bill Gates' office with Bill Gates Sr. And I said, wow, that's a good person to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, uh, let's yeah, talk about... Let's talk. My about, connections have been like the bedrock of 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 my career so far. I mean, I don't know what I would have done without that cold emailing network that turned into mentors, that turned into advisors. Um, they're they're the core of of how I go forward every day. I I love how you think about like the way that I see with the way that I understand you think about yourself. I love that you you have these passions and interests, and you're not really committed to anything yet. I think that's really awesome. Like, I'm really kind of curious to check in with you in another five to 10 years and like, see what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's obvious that whatever you're going to be doing is, is awesome. And you're definitely, gonna, hopefully <laughs> you're definitely going to make your parents proud. That's for sure. Uh, I want to, <laughs> I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about like what some of your, uh, personal projects are like, sure. Um, I, cause I, I'll let you sort of introduce them because I don't really know like what you can talk about and what you can't. I want to be really careful about that, but I definitely want to make sure that we talk a little bit about dimension. Sure. Um, yeah, Dimension is a project I worked on um, for a solid amount of last year. I got really into tablets and iPad 
just because I saw, you know, I've always thought I was in the next generation. Um, turns out there's a gener- there's starting to be like a new generation even below me, um, and they're all growing up on iPads. And I said, well, this is the future of computing. You know, just like I came into work and said, no way we're using Illustrator, we're using Sketch. A lot of people will come into work and say, there's no way we're using com- MacBook Pros. I want to use my iPad Pro. Um, so I said, there's this great design tool, but it's not on tablet. I might as well adapt it to the tablet myself, hoping that it will get on iPad and I'll be able to ditch my computer for an iPad. Um, so I went about adapting Figma and Sketch. They all have the same UI, basically, um, to tablet interface. And that means getting rid of keyboard shortcuts, which is like the worst thing to say to any person who's productive on a computer. Oh, even, getting rid even of if, a mouse. Even if you have the, the keyboard for iPad? The goal of of dimension was to say i want this flat on a table okay um i'm really on the go here right. can i be as efficient and effective on an ipad as without as okay. i am on the computer um and it was pretty cool i mean i learned a lot i talked with a lot of people i sat down with a lot of designers to see if my prototypes um held up and i mean i didn't build it just because i don't have figma source code um but I did design it on Figma, and I kind of launched it out there as a blueprint um, and made it open source. So you can go download the files if you want, theostrauscom slash dimension. And um, I mean, 150 people have all taken it and downloaded it and changed some aspect of it. And um, Evan Wallace, who's the, who's the CTO of Figma, has been playing around with iPad stuff. And I mean, iPad's very much the future. And... Right now, there's this problem where everyone has that one app that they have on their computer, but they don't have on iPad. So the mm-hmm. goal is, you know, I'm doing this for design. Someone else will do it for X. Another person will do it for Y. And another person will do it for Z. And eventually, yeah, we'll be able to fully go over to the to the tablet train because that's that's where the future's heading. Has anyone um, used your thinking to figure out how they would do that on like a for example, like a Microsoft Surface tablet? Totally adapts. Totally adapts. Um, as long as you have a stylus, I mean, you're pretty much set to go. Awesome. What else, what else are you working on? Uh, or what, right what, now, or, or what, are, what have you worked on recently that you're excited about, whether it's a side project or something from one of your, your jobs or apprenticeships or whatnot? Totally. Right now, I'm, I'm really excited about um, how can we make apps without code? Um, I kind of want to take all those apps that are designed in Figma that don't really have data feeding into it and have that capability. So how can we have a backend that's just as visual as Figma's front end and has complete parity with the backends that coders access programmatically? And then how do you tie the two together? Um, and that's a really big problem. And it's been really exciting to research. I'm obsessed with research. You could probably tell by the extent I go to to find someone's email address. <laughs> but it's been really exciting to research not just what's happening now. There are around like 40 tools all trying to do this. But there have been so many technologies from the 90s and from the 80s that have laid the pieces of the puzzle. Just no one's put them together. I mean, I'm reading an 800-page manual about this technology called HyperCard which came with every original Macintosh. And you I could used build, HyperCard. That's badass. You could create your own basically like apps and it had auto layout even, um, which Figma just got. And I've been researching Next, um, Next Open Doc um, and Next uh, Enterprise um, Open Framework, Objects Framework. And it lays out how we can build these databases visually and how we can connect all these elements together. And history repeats itself. And we're very close to having this tool come to fruition where you can, you don't need to be an engineer. You don't need to be a designer. You could just do it and take your product from zero to 100. That sounds awesome i mean there's i mean it doesn't just sound awesome i mean it's very clear that that's you know where things are going and how we need how we need to get there um that's that's totally cool i mean you you definitely have a groove like i mean regardless of what you should 
choose to do with your your career. I, mean, I actually kind of hope that you do like become a designer or, or go into the design field because I think you know the field needs you know needs people like you. I mean, I'm not the only one like me out there. Yeah. I, there are many. I'm pretty sure when I get turned 25, I'm going to be like rats. There are so many other 25 year olds in this space. Uh, just the exciting thing is, is I got in it early and I can see where we're heading and I can see what's important to focus on. And when I'm working on with this creating app without code, we need a much better acronym for it. I've been trying to figure it out. Um, and this tablet um, interface stuff, like how can we marry the two? And then how can we have, um, how can we have designers that are, that are building entire apps and kids who are designers building those apps on a tablet. Now we're really unlocking design for an entire new generation. And not in, just an entire new generation, but an entire new demographic because tablets are much less expensive than computers. So now we're opening up this field to so many more people. And that's what excites me. Yeah. So this, this adventure that you'll be going on when you go work for Apple, I mean, based on what you've said today, it sounds like that's that's going to be kind of a, a temporary thing for you while you sort of decide whether you're going to college. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they'll like me. Huh? <laughs> Maybe they'll like me. I don't know. I Would I would I not go to college to stay somewhere? Um, no. I'd say give me a year. Um, let, me, let me try this college thing yeah. out. Um, but I've met some extraordinary people at Apple. I mean, people who've been there for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm just so excited to learn. And it's like learning from people like you. Um, I have a lot further to go. Uh, and there are a lot of great people to learn from along the way. Yeah. When you were at Postmates, did you happen to um, meet anyone on the engineering team by the name of Ulf? I did not. Uh. Postmates X is, a, is an interesting organization um, because we are separated from the main organization. Oh, okay. So we're in our own office and we're completely siloed. Oh, okay. So we don't really know what's going on at Postmates and Postmates didn't really know what was going on at X. Um, so that was a really interesting experience on its own because I could see how a tiny team functions within a really big organization. Postmates is 1,600 people, if you can believe it. Wow. And that's excluding couriers. Wow. Well, I had, I had a few questions for you, but... Um some of them I'm not going to ask just because I want to be respectful of the fact that you're not quite sure you want to, what you want to do yet, but I will try to find a way to rephrase them. Um, sure. Go ahead. What is it that you, you know, I mean, you know, if, if we, if we look at a couple of different sort of light speed jumps ahead, like totally three year, three years from now, you know, like we're, <laughs> we're not a light speed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's over like that, but you know, we're, like what, uh, what do you what do you hope to accomplish? Like, I mean, or I don't know, even know if that's the right way to ask it. Like, what like what is a if you could if there was a way to articulate like what your vision for yourself is and the things that you want to do? Like, let, let, okay, maybe maybe we look a little bit longer term. Five years from now, we record another. Sure. Po we're recording another podcast. I'll hold you up to that promise. I mean, okay. I'm totally down to come back on. All right, five years from now, we're recording another another podcast. Like. What is it that you you hope to be like really jazzed about and have accomplished by that time? Um, I mean, I've been exploring a lot of different technologies and a lot of different problems that te that those technologies pose. And five years from now, I really hope I found a technology that I really want to marry for like a solid few years and a problem that the technology poses that I really want to solve, and a company that I can build around that solution that I can, that I can lead for a while and, and really help build. Um, I don't know what that technology is. I don't know what that product is. I don't know what that solution is. Uh, but I am interested in so many things. I'm interested in this no-code space. I'm interested in self-driving. I'm interested in electric aviation. We're seeing flying cars happen now. We're, we're seeing hydroponic um, growing systems. So a hundred times um, the amount of crop a uh, regular farmer can grow in Iowa can be grown in one square foot in a warehouse in New York City. Whoa. That's going to that's gonna totally change the game um, for resources. And we're seeing this rise 
of remote education and remote work, which is really exciting because many, many more people can gain access to education and then apply that and they don't need to move to a major urban center like New York, like San Francisco, like Austin. Um, and I think that is going to just boost creativity, boost productivity across across the, the world. Awesome. Um, uh, I, don't know, I don't Have you ever been to Austin? I have not. I've been really wanting to go. I, I'd love to go to South by. Um, All right. Not well, made it yet. let me pitch. Let me give you the big pitch then. Um, we are doing, and this is the first time we're announcing it, but everyone that's a listener, put this on your calendar. We're doing a massive party with Figma. And, Whoa. and there'll be an event. And, you know, if anyone has ever been to our, we throw the best South by Southwest party. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're also looking for people that can hop on a panel to talk about Figma. And, yeah. um, if you, if, if you want to come, you're more than, more than happy, happy to come. I, let let us let us hop on to the offline space and discuss that more. All right, I, let's do that. I would love to do that. All right, awesome. Um, so um, I, I just and congrats to, do for what? the announcement. Congrats for the announcement. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I I, really, I look forward to the to those to to this to the South by stuff. I mean, uh, we and 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 I'm also like gonna toot our horn or horn a little bit. We know how to we know how to throw a, a good <laughs> South by Southwest party. I'm holding you to it. <laughs> I, I, I promise that if you do come, you won't, uh, you, you won't uh, regret it. Um, Great. yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I want to thank you for, again, for your patience with me, like, you know, get it, getting this on the books and, uh, it's a, it's a, this is my hobby and my, my passion. So like, it's, it's taken a while to do that, but I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to come here and, and, uh, have a chat. I want to thank you for having me on. I mean, it was such a, a great opportunity and no problem at all taking the time. I mean, you've had some little children to deal with and uh, that's great. I mean, it's really amazing what you're doing. Thanks, man. Well, why don't, um, how can people connect with you if they want to uh, holler at you or see the work you're doing and whatnot? Yeah, theostrauss.com. Uh, my email is theo at theostrauss.com and my Twitter username is at Theodore Strauss. Um, if you work at Twitter, Maybe you can give me at Theo Strauss because it is currently occupied. Um, but yeah, those are the ways to contact me and check out my stuff, and I will respond. Awesome. Thanks, Theo. Um, we'll see you Thank next you. time on the Hustle Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers. You too. See ya.